This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, but gold still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people who will hold the truth in Jesus Christ's name. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman Pope rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome's sweet lie with fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man. Salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today. They offer up another way, a counterfeit. A compromise Beware the ancient Papal lie With such a cloud Of witnesses Who by grace Died in their Lord Recall their Memory to say By the same Faith we live today Hello and welcome to another broadcast from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This is a broadcast in a slightly other format than otherwise, because a few days ago I was talking to my good brother in Christ from the United Kingdom, England over there, over the channel here from Belgium, uh, on Skype, and we recorded that call intentionally, uh, so he knew that it was recorded with the idea of making a broadcast afterwards of it, with a totally new subject, uh, something that you probably not have heard from by yet, I guess. Um, the point is that you see already in the title, The English Common Law, Equity, Germany and Excellence of History, this is not a normal title that I usually have, because what do I have to do with law? <laughs> um, the idea to this broadcast came some weeks ago when Tom Press introduced me to his friend uh, Robert Newman, and we have had some talks on Skype since then, and he knows a lot about the subject that we are talking about, and even though you think that probably the first half hour will lead to nothing interesting, I can assure you the two parts are very interesting and there will be successive parts later on and dealing with things that you've probably even heard of but more in a conspiracy way of uh, listening to like um, the CESTIKV Act and you are a person and what is law all about and what is law actually and all this stuff. I cannot go into this because I'm also not very much learned about this, but Robert has a very good knowledge of this. So without any more ado, I will leave it to the recording that I did a few days ago and uh, leave you with that. And of course, you can always comment in the comment section as you are used to, or you can contact Robert directly with the email address that I will blend into the video and that you can also find in the description box of the video itself. So, now, let's hear it from Robert, what he has to say. And then we will have this part one and then afterwards there will be a part two. Enjoy! 
Um, I'm I'm Ro- uh, I'm Robert. I live in the south of England in a place called Dorset. There's quite a few German speaking people who come to this part of England. Um, it's famous for its fossils. The, the, <laughs> the, 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 the geology here in Dorset is very famous. It's uh, some it's something strange about the geology of England is that there are many there are many wonderful kinds of rocks here. And geologists come from all over the world to see this uh, remarkable. It's the only part of England that has no motorway. Is that uh, is is that the region of I don't know Brighton or something at the sea? Not not very far. Brighton is to Brighton is closer to London. Uh, only because I know that Brighton has these uh, stones at the at the beach, you know. Brighton uh, Brighton is uh, much closer to London. Dorset is between. Dorset is on the English coast, mm-hmm. near France. It's only 30 miles from France. Yeah, so but it, it also has these beaches with pebbles, right? It has beaches with pebbles. It has some sandy beaches. I've been here for about five years, but I'm originally from Scotland. Mm-hmm. My, my parents were English, but I was born in Scotland, so I've been living in exile <laughs> since that, <laughs> for the last... Uh, uh, you know, I, I, You're a legal uh, alien. I'm an alien, yeah, an alien, yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, I, I work for an area of law called equity, but I'm not a lawyer. In fact, uh, I, I'm not interested in being a lawyer, but I am interested in knowing the law, just like you are, and like every, most other people are interested in knowing about the law, but I'm not part of the legal industry. So yeah. I'm com- I'm completely free. You know, I am uh, as a Christian man, I am free to learn about the law. In fact, we are encouraged to learn about the law. That, and that makes you directly very sympathetic to my listeners, I guess, because if you were yeah. a lawyer. <laughs> oh no, no, I'm definitely not a lawyer. A lawyer is someone who takes control of your life because you give it to him, and he uses it for his own career and his own his own objectives, and he is part of the system which is controlling you in the first place. So uh, it's not a great idea to be a lawyer. But I know they do some good things, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about equity, and equity is something beyond the legal side of, of life. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, today I wanted to talk about the English common law. I don't know if you've heard of the expression of the common law but anyway it's called the common law the english and i put that in inverted commas english the english common law equity germany and accidents of history and i also put in brackets for accidents uh, in inverted commas accidents of history so yeah, it's there, are, there are no accidents. Really. There are no accidents, but they are called accidents, and uh, we will see why they are called accidents uh, in, a, in a minute. Um, let me start by saying thank you very much, Jörg, for uh, allowing me to share these opinions. Oh, well, thank you very on, much for coming on my show, Rob. On this on this subject, before I begin, um, I don't want to be labelled as a historian. And I also don't want to be a lawyer. Well, okay, what do you want to be, Robert? <laughs> uh, how, how about uh, a Christian? A Christian, I'm a Christian, yeah. <laughs> I want to begin by, I don't really want to be labelled as a historian, although I will be talking about historical things. So you may be interested to know what I think history is and what it's not. Um, I'm not one of these dogmatists, and I don't have a rigid agenda. To me, the History is is the whole span of time in which the will of God is revealed to mankind and realized, and realized, yeah, and realized. So the whole span of time is the is the is the uh, is, is the only history that I believe is really important. And I think history is the subject that we can speak about without needing to be dogmatic, and we should always. Um, in a conversation, we should always exchange our opinions without necessarily needing to argue. But um, I that's, that's right. But we have to consider, of course, that most people who think who know history have the history teaching from the Jesuits, from the educational oh. system, 
Yes. And those, this is most of the time wrong history Absolutely. that is taught. Absolutely. So yeah. this broadcast is actually about telling people about the true history, the often hidden history or the hidden meaning of history, um, by telling the people some things only the so-called initiated often know. Um, I would say that the initiated people that you're talking about Most of these people control the lower levels of society. Most of them are these people. They, they are, they are, um, it's like, what do they say? A little, a little truth is dangerous. You know, the people that they have, they have a little bit of knowledge. And it's the same with university graduates. They have some knowledge, but they have just enough knowledge to confuse themselves and to confuse everybody else. Yeah, and to later be <laughs> uh, compartmentalized. To be compartmentalized, to be specialized, to the point of they, they don't understand anything except their own subject. And then they learn that their own subject, they know nothing about that also, <laughs> because they've learned, it, they've learned it by some dogmatic process that they must never question. And I think that's the difference with the Christian perspective, is that you can always ask, not in unbelief, but in belief. Because, or you may want to under, or to know something that you don't know, and you can study, and eventually, you get an answer for that. So I think there's a difference between having a degree or belonging to an alumni, and and knowledge is one thing, but an understanding that is something else. That is that is a bonus. That's true, and yeah. only the Bible gives us real understanding. Yes, yes. Um, so. If I to start, I'm going to start on the subject of the English common law, equity, Germany, and accidents of history, which is an unusual. I think everybody would agree that that's an unusual combination of subjects. But anyway, um, I want to quote from a book. But the name of this book is called "The Law: The Law of Succession." Succession. I don't know if you have a German word for that, Jörg, but uh, the law of succession. Um, the law of succession, testamentary and intestate. It's an unusual book. The law of succession, testamentary and intestate. It was written by an English author called W.S. Holdsworth. I'll send you these references after we, we finish speaking. He was a 19th century lecturer at um, Oxford. I, w I won't bore you. I won't bore people by reading much of this book. I just want to read the first sentence that he wrote in this book. And he begins this book, The Law of Succession, Testamentary and Intestate. And he wrote this, and I'm going to quote what he said, the very first lines of his book, very first sentence of his book, page one, paragraph one, sentence one. The common law of England springs from the custom of the king's court. The king's court dates from the reign of King Henry the Second. So I'll just repeat then. The common law of England springs from the custom of the king's court. The king's court dates from the reign of King Henry II. Where do we have to put that in history about King Henry II? King Henry II lived between 1133 and 1189. So about 900 years ago. About 900 years ago, right? So this is the, the so it's not the law of England; it's the common law of England. Notice that it's the common law of England springs from the custom of the king's court. The king's court dates from the reign of King Henry II, 1133 to 1189. Uh, so um, I've read this book. And it's a very important book. Uh, 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 so I'm not urging anyone to start reading English law books, not even Englishmen. But if you, but I have read it, and I'm I, I'm not urging anyone to start becoming a lawyer, or becoming a recluse, or hiding in a cave to read books like this, which are actually out of print. 
it's simply that it's simply that some law books, some good law books, they usually start with something. Good law books always start with something which is condensed mm -hmm. in the in the very first sentence. And most people are in a big hurry to read things. They don't mm -hmm. stop to 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 uh, to consider. Uh, what is this common law of England springs from the custom of the king's court? How does it spring from? What is the king's court? And uh, what is the significance of King Henry II? Uh, what is the custom? If it springs from the custom of the king's court. And these are, so I'm going to look at this first of all. The common law is the name given to the application of the law, you have law in Germany, uh, is, the, is the name given to the application of the law, which regulates the general population in Germany, or, or, or in England. So the common law in England is the name given to the application of the law, which regulates the general pub, the, or the public, or the, the, the public in England. It is slightly different from what we call the civil law. You have civil law uh, in Belgium, Germany? You have, you have. I guess so, yeah. Yeah, you, you have, right, okay. That's, anyway. that's what rules us, eh? The rules, yeah, okay. So, so the common law at is... Least the, that is what, at least that is what we think, because people are not uh, informed very well about the fact that the yeah. civil law has been infiltrated by Roman Catholic canon law. Absolutely, right, yeah, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> but that's the, probably something you will address later. Yes, I'll, we'll, we'll start at the, uh, we'll start here at, so the common law is the name given to the application of the law. There are various applications of the law. I must explain that. But this particular application is given to the law which regulates the ordinary population. That is to say, the public, the general public in England. Mm -hmm. And it is different from the civil law. The civil law also regulates the population in England, but they are two different things. They are not the same. The common law, the, different, uh, the, the chief difference between common law and civil law is that common law is derived from the Bible. Common law is derived from the Bible, it's from the Old Testament. But it's called common law because it is slightly different from the Old Testament. Why is it slightly different from the Old Testament? It is um, kinder. It is more kind than the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it's simply black and white, right? The application of the law, the letter of the law and all these kind of things, right? A very, a very a rigid black and white situation. You know? But the common law in England is the, you could say that it's the law of the Old Testament practiced in such a way that it's not so harsh as the severity of the Old Testament. Does that make any sense? Yeah, okay. It's not, not so, not so harsh, but it's not so kind also. It's not so flexible. It's a little bit flexible, but it's not very flexible. That is the common law. Uh, so, and w the chief difference between the common law and civil law is that common law is basically derived from the Old Testament. It has certain flexibility so that some benefit can come to people from its application. It's, it's the law of the land, the common law is the law of the land. Well, what people today most of the times have heard about is the law of the sea. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, well, that's that that that's what I was just about to say. The civil law, the civil law is applied to the land because, uh, for example, uh, maybe there is a war and there is an occupying force in the country, then, or maybe there is a bankruptcy. Maybe the government is completely bankrupt. Then they will impose another system of law. And this law will be called the civil law. See, that's the civil law. So the common law 
in, in normal times, the common law is the law of the general public. But in troubled times, it is the civil law. And they are, they, they, they are very similar. In, one of them is a reflection of the other one. Civil law, common law. And I'm not, and I'm not, I, I'm, I'm only trying to, ex to get this concept in, so if, if the government collapsed, they would have to replace it by another government. And that temporary government would be to deal with the emergency situation. And that's the civil law. Does that make any sense? Well, yes and no. <laughs> yes and no. Okay. Yes and no. Okay. Um, uh, the, in Germany, or uh, do you know? Have you, how do? You, what's the word for the ordinary German court, where somebody goes for a traffic ticket, or well, if they don't pay their uh, town hall? Well, the German, the German term for that would probably be Amtsgericht, I, I guess. Amtsgericht. Yeah. Right. This this is the lower level courts, the lower level courts for traffic tickets, speeding charges or something that kind yeah. of odd. Yeah. OK. Right. Um, this in uh, this this situation of the what you could call the lower courts. It's not the higher courts. It's just the ordinary everyday statutory court. I don't know if you have you know what that means. Uh, statutory. It means that. The German Parliament have have passed certain rules, and everybody has to follow those rules. Yeah, through the German Parliament. The German Parliament said that you can only drive 80 kilometers an hour. You cannot drive 100 kilometers an hour. Yeah, I get that. It's, it's called statute. Statute. Statute is the regulations or the rules for the public. These are statutes, and they are made by parliaments. But parliaments do not make laws. That's an unusual thing. Parliaments do not make laws. And if I say that, people will be very surprised. They will believe that parliaments are there to make laws. But they're not there to make laws. The word parliament, parley, means to speak, to talk. Yeah. Parliament, what does, it means to talk your mind, to speak your mind. Parliament, parliament. They do not make laws. Can you imagine a politician six months ago? She's working in the movie industry, but she's very famous. And she was elected to become a member of parliament. She was knitting, how do you say, jersey? How, knitting pullover. She yeah. was knit, Six months ago, she was knitting a pullover at home. She has no idea about the law. But suddenly, yeah. she, suddenly she's now an MP, a, a member of parliament. Yeah, in we the, have examples of that, like, like that here in Belgium too. Right, so then these politicians now become members of the parliament, and everybody thinks that these people are making laws. But they're not making laws. Parliaments do not make laws. Parliaments make regulations. And these regulations are, are rules. If you join... A club, if you join, for example, Wimbledon Tennis Club, if you want to be a member of Wimbledon Tennis Club, you will have to accept the rules of the Wimbledon Tennis Club. Yeah? Makes sense. Yeah. These are the statutes. These are the rules of the Wimbledon Tennis Club. Parliament has rules. Parliament makes rules. But they do not make laws. Parliament only makes the rules... Uh, and the, the regulations or the, or, the, or the statutes if you want to be a member of Wimbledon Tennis Club you have to uh, comply with or the rules of the tennis club it's quite, quite simple if you want to be a member of the general public you have to comply with the rules of the general, for the general public and that's what parliament and above the parliament is the law itself. So that, 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 that's the law. The law is always above the parliament. Parliament is not the law. The law is above the parliament. Um, so 
uh, then the question of what, where does the name common law, where does that come from? Why do they call it the common law? Well, it comes from the New Testament. You know, the common people. The common, the common men heard him gladly. You know that New Testament gospels? Yeah. The common men heard him gladly. Common. And so that means the ordinary men in the street. The common what they, people. What yeah. they also call lay people. The lay people, yeah. As the lay people. As for common, we might refer to the New Testament where we read the common per people heard him gladly. And in the book of Acts, where the early Christians had all things in common. And so on. I mean simply, that's all I mean. It's, it's a simple thing to understand. The common, common man, the common... Now, other people if, will get hold of these things and they will turn it upside down. And so you find, for example, the rulers of empire, empire builder, the people who want to build empire, have constructed rules which they say is for the common good. Notice that term, the common good. Yeah, that's a, that's a term Pope Francis likes to use very, very much. Common good, yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, empires have... Empires have uh, decided on the common good, and who decides the common good? It is the general who decides the common good. The general, uh, the so-called general good or common good. The Jesuit order um, decided the common good for the slaves in the slave plantations of Paraguay. So yeah, the reductions of Paraguay in the, the 60s and 70s, uh, 17th Ex century. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Did, did you know that one of the greatest admirers of the Jesuit slave plantations of Paraguay was the philosopher Rousseau? He, he, he was a great admirer of the Jesuit plant, uh, reductions in Paraguay. He believed that the future society should be modeled on the public good, the general good, he called it. Mm -hmm. Well, that was the Jesuit plantations. You don't need much imagination to realize what he was really talking about. <coughs> the enslavement of, of human beings. Um, uh, so, so when you look at all of these things, we're really going to talk about the public side of life and or the rules or the law which governs the public side of life and then we're going to look at the law of the other side of life which is the private side of life there's public there is private um, these things are they compatible can is there can you make the public side of life and the private side of life compatible how can you make them compatible are they? Is it possible to make them compatible? And this question, it is possible to make them compatible, but but very few people uh, examine this question. So there has to be, imagine two sides of a river. One side is the public side and the other side is the private side of life. And could there be a bridge between these two different positions? And this bridge, if this bridge exists, let's call this bridge, uh, uh, let's call this bridge equity. It's something good, some, some, it's a good idea, uh, in which you had a system where people respect private life. But you notice always that the public side of life, they want to control more and more and more of life, even public, even the private side. Yeah. You, you, see, you see that? Absolutely. So, the, so there has to be a balance here. There has to be some, what you call in English, an abridgment. An abridgment. There has to be some limitations. There has to be some balance. There has to be some solution. And the solution, most people believe that they need more government. Government has to do more and more and more and more for people. We want more legislation, more laws, more unfairness, more things. People are 
asking government always to do more and more and more things, which is a big mistake, of course. Because if you're in the legal, in, if you're in the public side of life, and we ask government to do more and more and more and fund many things, eventually everybody will be end up end up working for the state. Or yeah, we will all be regulated from, we'll all be regulated, from yeah. cradle to grave. Yes. So, uh, so uh, the, the next going back, starting with the Bible. Um, so we, uh, time and time again, nations and politicians and leaders have forgotten the law, or they made up their own interpretations of the law, or they've just ignored it, or reinvented what they call the law. If you tell most people that Parliament do not make laws, I mean, can you make the law of gravity, or can you, if a law is a law? You didn't invent it, you simply discovered it, right? Yeah. No, nobody invented laws. If it's a law, it's a law. So nobody's, nobody's making laws. Well, <laughs> we're only, we're only well, discovering laws. Nobody invented laws. Well, let's say that the law was given to man and the law was given um, to the Israelites at Mount Sinai. Yes. But their, they could, God, their God gave them the law in Ten Commandments. Yes. And the problem is the, that when people went away from these laws, they always make laws more complicated to sail yeah. around them. Yes, yes. And yes, that's yes. something that you can see in the history also when you go back to Babylon and yeah. you dig up these old stone tablets where there is law of that time written on. You can see that I think the oldest law tablet that I've heard of, there was about uh, 80 or 90 laws written on it. Yes. That was uh, only not, not that much more than the Ten Commandments of God. Yes. But from that, everything derived that we have today, and when you go to the law books today, well, the law of a country can fill more than a, a library that you can even go through in one day. That oh, big. yes. Absolutely, yes. So, so th we, we also have the expression um, that uh, governments are corrupt, and the more corrupt a government gets, the more laws it needs. Yes, that's perfectly true. And, but, uh, but I also believe that the government that we have is the government that we deserve. If people, if people as a whole only get the government that they deserve because it's a reflection of their, their will, if people vote for certain things, that is exactly what they will get. I think we get the government that we deserve. That's that's what I think. Yeah, most um, of the time, people don't even care about the yes, government uh, as long as the government leaves them alone. Uh, as long as the government leaves them alone. Uh, if if only uh, I'm not um, no I, I'm if only people would understand that the government is not a sugar daddy. No. The, gov the government was not invented to be the answer to every problem. And, uh, but uh, I wanted to, to also say that, so uh, the, the kings of the earth, the kings of the earth, they are subject to the law also. Would you agree with them? Well, in a certain term, yes, uh, they are subject to the law, but uh, if they don't like the law, they're going to make up their own law. Exactly. That's, that's the I problem mean. that we are faced with today, right? Yes. Like, for example, when we just leave England and Germany and look to the United States of America, since George W. Bush and since 9-11, the United States of America is more or less ruled not by laws, but by executive orders the president yes. makes. Hmm. And why does he make all these executive orders? Because they fit his agenda. And yes. his agenda is, of course, the agenda of the Antichrist. I, I, I absolutely agree. Um, I, I, I absolutely agree that if you notice that these are executive orders, and why are they executive orders? Because most people are still in the kindergarten side of their life. Yeah. They're depending upon the statutes, the rules, the regulations, the politicians, the electoral process, the political parties, 
and so on, none of them will actually fulfill anything. They will simply go round and round in circles and you will get more of the same. And people, your, your grandfather, my grandfather, they could have told us twen when we were young men that politicians are a waste of time. <laughs> but, but, but we were not, what we were not listening to them. We wanted to find out for ourselves, you know. So, <laughs> is that right? So, uh, so, so the kings of the kings of the earth, when the Queen of England or the Queen of uh, United Kingdom, when she was crowned in Westminster Abbey, she one of the parts of the one of the parts of the coronation, she held the Bible in her hand, and she promised to uphold the laws of God. Which, uh, but which, she does which, not. She does not repeat which, the royal declaration anymore, right? But no, I'm, I I don't know whether she did the declaration. I'm only saying that here here is the uh, here is a moment where people, where the leader of the of the nation or the lead, leader of the country, is holding in her hand. And in fact, Scotland is represented at that coronation. The head of the Church of Scotland gives her the Bible and says, said to the Queen, Your Majesty, this is the greatest book that mankind can afford. And he, uh, he gives her the New Testament. This is part of the coronation. So there is no question that above kings, above rulers, above governments is the law of God. Having said all of that, Jesus in the New Testament, notice what, you know, you've heard of, so there is the law there, there's the rule of law that God is in complete control, ultimately. And then you see in the New Testament, notice how Jesus treats this subject of the rule of law. He, he says, uh, therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you so to them for this is the law and the prophets so there's the law and the prophets that is the so-called golden old, that's the, the so-called old testament the law yeah, the and the prophets yeah the golden rule the golden rule it's not simply the law it's also the prophets New Testament, how many times does it say in the Gospels, this was done to fulfill this, this was done to fulfill this, this was done to fulfill. How, how, well, how often is the word fulfill used in the New Testament? Hundreds of times? I don't know, probably well, I didn't count it. So. <laughs> but, yeah, but you see, it, it's it, many references to this. So the prophets, the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets. So the law is a wonderful thing, but the law and the prophets, that gives us this golden rule. Uh, this, this, there, that, um, and then I think it was Martin Luther who said, or he wrote it somewhere. I remember him uh, reading it. If you read a verse of the Bible and you fail to see Jesus Christ Go back and read it again. That is Martin Luther. Mm -hmm. um, and about prophets, Amos 3 7. If, um, uh, what is it? God will do nothing except first he reveals it to his servants, the prophets. Amos 3 7. So he reveals his word to the prophets, the people don't listen to it, and then there's complete confusion, and so they get kings and emperors and you know, popes and everything else, right? So that's what happens. That's what. Uh, but anyway, King Henry II. King Henry II, we started talking about him. Uh, he lived in the 12th century. And Henry II... Um, was a good king, and there are not many good kings, but Henry II was a good king. He did not want to tax the people of England too much. In fact, he was he was uh, uh, he was not doing a good job, according to the Pope. <laughs> The Pope was not very happy with Henry II. Henry II was a complete disaster. He he gathered 
about 20% of the tax which the Pope said that has to be sent to Rome. Year after year, he was failing to gather the tax. And he didn't want to do anything about it. He, you know, he, he believed that the people should not be oppressed by the tax system. So the representatives of the Pope in London, in, in England, in Canterbury and Oxford, reminded him that you, you, you failed again. You're failing with your tax system. You have to do something about every year you have to send the money to Rome. And it just got worse and worse. Henry II, I don't know why, but Henry II was reluctant to become too, um, uh, too, uh, what's the word? To enforce, he was reluctant to enforce strict, strictly the tax system on the English people. And they got, Rome became more and more angry with the situation. And eventually, after several years, they warned him that if you do not start to do the to collect the tax properly or satisfactorily for us, then we will remove from your government the complete tax system. We will remove it from you and we will give it to other people. <laughs> you know, this was this was the threat if Henry the Sec for Henry the <clears> Second. <throat> so another few years passed. I think it was one or two years, and eventually the Pope decided to do something about it. He ordered Henry II, King of England, to come down to Canterbury, to Canterbury Cathedral, and in Kent, which is in the southeast of England. And he traveled down to Kent, and they were going to talk about this. They were going to get some kind of solution. And when he arrived, he was told to arrive as the king, so he came with the crown and all of this. So he came, went into the cathedral, and as soon as he went into the cathedral, they closed the doors of the cathedral. They ordered him to take off the crown, to throw it on the ground. And then they locked the, well, they closed the doors of the cathedral, and then the monks who were controlling Canterbury Cathedral got ropes and they beat him. They, they badly injured him. Mm -hmm. They would not let him out of the church all night. And they hurt him very badly. This is Henry II. They beat him until the next day uh, when they, they allowed him to go. When they allowed him to go, they had accused him of killing their representatives and stuff like this. They just invented these stories that Henry II had killed one of their agents. His name was Beckett. Beckett was the, the agent for the papacy in Canterbury. Beckett did not like Henry II. <laughs> Henry II did not like Beckett, right? So uh, when Beckett was murdered, when Beckett was killed, they was blamed... That, uh, was that Thomas Beckett? Thomas Beckett, yeah. yeah well, wasn't he a cardinal or something? Yeah, yeah he, was, he was the Pope. Uh, uh, it's just that that name rings a bell with me, with the Beckett, research yeah. I've done over, yeah. uh, over the years. And Beckett, Thomas, yeah. Thomas Beckett was one of the most uh, yeah, yeah. Catholic people in, 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 in England at that that's, time, right? That's correct. He was yeah. the man who was putting the pressure on Henry II. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. anyway, when, when, Hen when uh, Beckett was murdered, when Beckett was murdered, the man who was accused of murdering him was Henry II. And so history, the books of history say that Henry II killed Thomas Beckett. Uh, but and in reality, he had nothing to do with that. And how um, can you come to that uh, reality? Well, how can uh, you get to this real history then? Well, uh, you can get to the real history by reading more than Roman Catholic propaganda. Okay. If you read several, there are several things which say co uh, different things. Henry II had many problems, but his, he was not a murderer. He was known as a good king. He didn't have time for murdering people. Um, uh, the, so uh, then, um, on Henry II is now injured or at least he's recovering mm -hmm. from
from being beaten up in the, in the church in, in Canterbury. You can see uh, examples of what I'm saying also in English history, but people don't read that kind of thing. They only read the official, you know, the multi, the, the histories which comply with the Roman version. Yeah, most so, of the times they even like yeah. to read Harry Potter more than that. Harry Potter, exactly. Right, so Henry II now is taken back to London to recover, but when he gets back to London, he orders his judges, he orders his chief justice, and this chief justice, his name was Glanville, Glen, uh, I think uh, Ranulf, Ranulf de Glanville, Ranulf de Glanville was the chief justice of England mm -hmm. at that time. He wanted to see Ranulf de Glanville. Ranulf de Glanville came to the king, and the king said, um, Glanville, I have a job for you. What, what, what job you have? I want you to do some research. I want you to study the Bible. I want you to study the Bible about the subject of tax. Tax. The tax. Okay. And when you finish that, and I want you to also read everything that you can find about the subject of tax. Can you do that? He says, of course I can do that. And when and if you if you can do this, I want a report on my desk as soon as possible. What <laughs> is what is the what is the law about tax? He said, of course I will do that. We are already writing a book on the laws of England. But he said, yeah, but I especially want this this uh, this subject to be given top priority. Can you do that? Yes, he said, I would. <laughs> so Glenville disappears. He starts to research the subject of tax, the tax system, and the Bible, the Bible and the tax system. Um now, Glanville was a very intelligent man. He said, you could read anything. I just want you to report back and tell me what is the law of tax from the biblical perspective and how are other countries doing this and please give me a picture. But it must be simple enough so that I can understand it. You can write as much as you want, but I want you to give me a condensed version and the document when you come back. So Glanville said, yes, okay, I'll do this. Glanville goes away. <laughs> Meanwhile, the letters continue from Rome. The war he has from... to raise more taxes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so, now, so now Henry II is in really big trouble. Uh, the next thing to happen would be that he would lose his crown and they would give it to somebody else. Or, you know, he's in, he's in a, a real big problem. Yeah, in, in danger of being excommunicated, right? Uh, yeah, anything. But, uh, because, so, because that's uh, what the Pope did at the time, because we are talking about the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, when the Antichrist, the Pope of Rome, ruled over the kings of the earth. Yes. As he does today, too. So when he excommunicates sure. a king, like he did, for example, with Henry IV in Germany, yeah. and mm -hmm. he had to go uh, to Canossa, you know. Yes. Absolutely. But, but, but please continue, Robert. I don't want right. to interrupt your flow of thoughts. Okay, so this is similar to what you know in Germany, right? So, okay. Um, so Henry then gets a communication from the, from the Pope's messenger. He said, um, Your Majesty, the, the messenger told him, the Pope has decided that if you do not improve your performance in the tax, we are going to make a special corporation which will do the tax. You will no longer have a tax department. We will do the new tax and we will give, we will make this new corporation in the city, in the city of London. Oh, and, and now it's getting interesting. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, and the shareholder for the new corporation, the shareholders of this tax authority, the shareholders, they will appoint agents in all of the province, all of the counties of England, mm -hmm. and they, that means you you will not have any more powers related to tax. We are going to take over this. 
So, so Henry's thinking that his life is coming to an end or something, right? Then a few weeks later, Glanville returns to Glanville returns to uh, London. He's been studying in Oxford and Cambridge and uh, the continent and in Germany, and he wanted to understand the tax, and he wanted to do a good job. He came back with his report, mm -hmm. and he came to, to see Henry the Second. The results of his... Uh, do you have your results? Yes, I have the results. Uh, uh, and what, what, are, what are the results? Can you explain it to me in just a few minutes? He said, yes, I can do that, but I have a large document. But this document is about the laws of England. He said, yes, but I only want you to talk about the tax system. Tell me, tell me about the tax system in a few minutes. How can, what can you tell me about that? Glanville said, well, basically, uh, there are a class of pe there is a group of people here in England who are exempt from the tax. There's a group of people who are exempt. They don't yeah. have to, they don't have to pay the tax. Like the clergy. And who, who are these people? Uh, the king said, who are these people? He said, well, there are certain groups like the clergy and uh, the barons, for example. The barons. The barons who owned the land of England. Yeah, said, the barons, the dukes, the lords. The dukes, yeah, these the, people. The, the so-called nobility. Yes, these nobility. Yeah, the nobility. The nobility are exempt. Not all of them. But the people, the ancestors of William the Conqueror, who, who owned the land of England, who are the legal owners of the whole land, these people do not have to pay tax. Mm. So then he said, okay, um, and why do they not have to pay tax? And Glen Glenville said, well, it, because they are barons and because they are they are nobility. He said, yes, yes, but if they are barons and nobility, why do the nobility, don't, why don't they have to? What does the law say about this? Why do the barons not have to pay tax? Why do the nobility not have to pay tax? I don't want to know that they don't have to pay. I want to know why, why yeah. they don't have to pay. And he said, well, um, it's, a, it's a little bit do you, <laughs> complicated. He, 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 he said, explain it to me, explain it to me. And he said, well, it's, it's, uh, it's because these are men who have made, uh, they have made a, a will. They have made a will. Yes, they have made a will. You know, how would you say in German? They have yeah, made a will, a, a t uh, testament. Testament. They have made a testament. Yeah. These people have made a testament. And after they make a testament, um, then they, in the eyes of the law, they are no longer considered to be children. But if you don't make a will, then in the eyes of the law, you are considered to be a child. And if you're considered to be a, ch a child, you are liable to pay the tax. So the king said, so these people have made a will. And because they made a will, they are exempt from the tax. Yes, he said, that's, that's, that's the situation. <laughs> Amazing, no? And he said, well, how many people know about this? He said, very few, very, very few people know about this. Like today, even less, probably. Okay. So Glenville said that very few people know about it. Even the, even the barons don't know about this. Why don't the barons know about it? Because the barons have a lawyer. The lawyer knows <laughs> these things, but they don't talk about it to the barons, right? The lawyers know these things. So these people have exemption from the tax because they have made a special kind of will. He said, yes, not every... And then the king asked him, uh, are there, is there more than one kind of will? He said, yes, there are various... There's only one kind of will which makes the people exempt. It's a living will. He said, a living will. What do you mean by a living will? He said, well, this will comes into force while, while the man is still alive. And Whereas we only know a testament, a will to leave for the things that have to be done with our possessions 
when we are already dead. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So this living <laughs> will, this living will, um, is the reason why they are exempt. But where do, where does the law say this? I've never heard of such a thing before. What you're telling me is completely new. <laughs> you know, he, this is this is Henry the Second. And he said, well, I will explain it to you. It's in the book. You know, it's in the, the things. Um, where is that written? Where does it say that? He said, well, it's in, it's in, it's, it's, it's in the, explain it to me. It's in the New Testament. Where does it say that in the New Testament? <laughs> so Glen, Glenville, Glenville is afraid, you know, he's afraid of the king. Yeah. But he, he's trying to explain it to him in a very simple way, but the king really wants to understand this. What are you saying? He said, it's in the New Testament. Where is it in the New Testament? Show me in the New Testament. Where does it say that? He said, well, uh, let's examine this, uh, if you want. Where does it say that in the New Testament? Um, it's... Uh, it's, it's, Are you um, referring to Galatians 4 again? Or what? No, no, no. I'm talking about oh. the gospel. It's in the gospels. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, where is it? It's, um, uh, um, I think it's... Okay. Let's well, I this. think that a lot of my listeners and even me who is listening on this side of the, <laughs> the end of the line are as... <laughs> Uh, dumbstruck as uh, as the King Henry the Second at that time. Uh, well, we want to know, Robert. <laughs> we want to know what you want to know okay. about this law and where is that uh, to be found in the New Testament? In the New Testament, it's absolutely in the New Testament. It's in the Gospels, right? So um, I'm just trying to find this, um, right? Uh, yeah, you oh, go. You go ahead and find. Okay. That. No, I mean this is just very simple things. But um, all right, uh, all right. Just a second. If you turn. To the right. Ah, oh, yes, is uh, yeah, Matthew. Yeah. If you go to Matthew the seventeenth chapter. Okay. Matthew seventeen. Okay. Right. Uh, right. So, oh, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, is it? Yeah, this is exactly here. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so it, it's, it's like many things they are so simple that people cannot see them and so uh, it's, it's but anyway Matthew 17 if you turn there to the 17th yeah, I got it open there, right. Matthew okay right okay uh, <laughs> excuse me after the go to the 24th yes, the 24th verse yeah okay and when they were come to Capernaum <clears throat> yeah. They that received tribute, money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? Uh -huh. Carry on. He saith, Yes. And when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? And Peter says unto him, Of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, then are the children free. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea, and cast an hook, and take up a fish that cometh first. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. Take that, and give unto them for me and thee. Yes, this is, this is exactly the, the part there, right. That is a very interesting part. Yeah, ch uh, verse 25. <laughs> yes, whom yes. do the kings of the earth take customs or tribute of their own children or of strangers strangers being the inhabitants of the lands right yes yes okay now it's, but, uh, it, it's uh, up to you to explain this in all way. right okay, okay? <laughs> <laughs> good oh thank you very much okay so if you go to uh, I'm trying to find the King James version for Matthew 17 right so let's have a look at I didn't all right, Matthew 17, right, um, KG, this is worth waiting for, I think it's, uh, oh yeah, uh, it's uh, quite uh, interesting, right, I think um, there are a lot of people who read through this part in Matthew 17 and don't understand what that, uh, what that actually means, and okay. certainly not the 27th verse, um, and, and take up the first that cometh up the fish, 
Uh, right. Uh, okay. Open, uh, open uh, to find a piece of money. Well, uh, I think <laughs> the beaches would be full of people who are going to fish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, okay, right. So, Matthew 17 and uh, verse um, uh, 24. And when they were come to... Cap- Do you know? Did you know that Capernaum was the head of the tax system in Israel at that time? No, I didn't know that. Capernaum was the headquarters of the tax system during the Roman occupation. Oh, okay. And when, when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? And Peter, he said, Yes. This is Peter who said yes. Peter was all, you know, he's very impetuous. He's, he's always defending, uh, he's always trying to protect, he's always very quick to say something. Yeah. He said, yeah, he said, yes, he does pay. He does pay these things. Notice what Jesus does. And when he was come into the house, notice he, he didn't correct Peter in the public. He corrected him when he came into the house. This oh, is yeah. absolutely. Absolutely, uh, yeah. absolutely beautiful this when he was come into the house Jesus prevented him uh, saying what thinkest thou Simon of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute of their own children or of strangers Peter said unto him of strangers Jesus said unto him then are the children free notwithstanding, lest we should offend them. See, notice that. So, we don't want to offend people. Mm. We don't want to bring offense. Therefore, go to the sea, cast a hook, take up the fish that first cometh up, and when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money that take, and give unto them for me and thee. Now, Capernaum was a Philistine city in the ancient times, mm-hmm. and the gods of the pay of the pagan world of the Philistines included the head of the fish, which was which of course is the mitre. You know, the head it looks like a fish. Yeah, fish. yeah, that goes that goes back to the fish god Dagon. Right, Dagon. Oh, Dagon, Dagon was the god of the Philistine tax system. Mm-hmm. And the symbolism, of course, the disciples did not understood what, understand what was happening. They had no idea why Jesus was sending them to the sea to get a fish, and they find the coin in the mouth of... It, it didn't mean anything to them, but it happened. And they didn't understand what... what because out of the mouth of out of the mouth of the fish is coming a coin. In other words, out of the system that they created, the law system, there was the remedy coming out of the mouth. What comes out of the mouth? Out of the mouth is coming words, no? It's a symbol. That inside this tax system is the remedy for the tax system. That's what it represents. That's that's what this thing means. So, uh, but more than this, what do you think? Do the kings of the earth take custom of their own children or of strangers? Peter said to him, strangers. Then the children are free. The children are free. Then the children are free, but not before. This is, the children are free. Do you remember I was describing the public domain as a kindergarten? Mm Mm-hmm. When I was a child, I was no more than a slave. There's, there's the children there. Then are the children free. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I just, uh, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, it's right then, to follow, yeah. Uh, then are the children free. So, uh, what does it say in Galatians? It says that uh, when I was a child, I was no more than a slave. So, also, when we were children, we were, uh, etc. This is this is St. Paul talking about that. We grew up inside this kindergarten. So uh, th- that's what I'm saying. From a legal point of view, you 
you must continue to pay the tax. Of course, if you're in the legal side of the system or the public side of the system, that's like absolutely what we have to do. And because you do not make a will to declare yourself living and out of the system, yes, if you are always caught in the system. Well, you are presumed you are presumed to have no interest in the beneficial side of of the system. If if somebody if somebody opens a bank account and you go away for five or six, ten, seven years or whatever, and nobody uses the bank system they will start to presume that you're not alive. And that's how, they, that's how the presumption that you must be lost beyond the sea because nobody's heard from you. Mm -hmm. And that is the justification to control your system. When you become older, that is the justification to consider that you're still a child or you're lost or you're incompetent or you don't know what you're doing. You're only a child. See that? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, and also with the mentioning of the sea, and we were talking about the law of the sea. Yes. And we know that in Bible prophecy, the sea is uh, has a meaning uh, of uh, nations, multitudes, multitudes of people, people, tongues, hmm. and people. Yes, yes, is, yes. Is that what that law of the sea actually refers to? Absolutely. That, that, uh, yeah, I mean, the, this is the, just 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 the thought that comes up in, in yeah, yeah, moment, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. So so the uh, so you have this here in England. Not long ago, there used to be a tax system of the land. It's called the inland revenue. Inland revenue. It belongs to the tax system of the land. And then about 20 years ago, they made a new organization. It's called the HMRC, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. Revenue and Customs, right? This used to operate only for the ports. The port uh, cities, you know. For, if you're coming in a ship, they check how much cargo you have and how much revenue you... That is to do with the law of the sea. Yeah. But then they amalgamated the law of the land and the law of the sea into one gigantic tax system. And then this, the law of the sea started to, to, started to do the administration of the tax on the land. Mm -hmm. And that's what United Kingdom today is like that. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, so, yeah, you can compare it to the, the sea coming onto the land. It's very similar. It's parallel, yeah? That yeah. situation. So, and if you, have, if you have a bankruptcy, imagine a country is bankrupt then they will make a new regime to go on top of the law. They will have the civil system. Or the well, I, I was told in school so many years ago that a state can never get bankrupt. A state cannot be bankrupt in the same way that a state cannot be, cannot be a creditor. How, if, if something is a state, it must be dead. But an estate is alive. Mm -hmm. A state is not alive. The Pope is lying in state. That means he's dead, right? If the Pope is lying in state, doesn't that mean that he's dead? No. Yeah. One of them is energized. The other one has no energy. What do they say? I know it's probably not true. E equals mc squared. If you take away energy from a body, it has no energy. And this, there's a difference between a state and an estate. I don't, how do you say estate in German? What's the word for that? A state. Well, I have to look. I have to look it up. Estate. Estate. Uh, let's. Uh, um, uh, air property. Air property. Yeah. yeah. Air, right. 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 Uh, <clears throat> uh, um, I'm just giving you another word for state that we use in German. So that's property uh, or discount or estate. Like you say. Yes. An estate. Ah, if you go to Acts 28.7, the book of Acts 28.7. Yeah. See if you I'm can there. find it. You got it? All right. Okay. What does it say in 28.7? It says, in the same quarters were possessions of the chief men of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. 
Yeah, 28-7, right? Okay. Um, uh, so, uh, the, uh, the word possessions, that, that word is, an, that is, that word is, means an estate. Um, well, let's find, I know you like the King James, I like very much, but the word estate, that is the meaning of the word estate. Um, let's take another Possessions example. and estate is uh, yeah. meaning the same thing, yeah. Yeah, but I want to show you a version of the Bible which uh, sometimes you, it's good to compare different versions. Uh, uh, you see it in this version. Uh, go to New Living Translation. Um, yeah. And you will see that I'm not inventing this. Somebody else, if, if it's invented, somebody else invented it. 28 7. Uh, the, uh, this link here. Just just to confirm that possessions and estate or whatever it is. is okay, uh, New Living Translation. Where do you want yeah. me to go there? Uh, the same verse, verse 7. Uh, okay, so that's um, Acts. Acts 28, 7. Acts mm -hmm. 28. Mm -hmm. so. uh, near the shore where we landed was an estate belonging to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us and treated us kindly for three days. Yes, now that, that's St. Paul, as you, you know are being shipwrecked on the island of Malta. Yeah. And after, shortly after he was shipwrecked, near, near the shore where we landed was an estate belonging. Notice that. And it's beautiful, right? So, he, And he gets a very friendly welcome when he goes there. Mm -hmm. He's allowed to stay there. And uh, so this, the, the subject of estate rather than state... They're two different things. The estate and the state are two completely different things. Um, we, uh, the estate is a private is a private thing. Mm -hmm. Even even the Romans understood estates. There was an estate. They have a villa on the estate and so on. These estates are very ancient things. And this estate belonged to a man called Publius, and he welcomed us. I mean, they were complete strangers, but they were welcomed. And, and the, the Bible is very clear about this. So this, in the second section, when we talk more about this, we will develop this thing and we will introduce the Roman law and Germany and we will connect these two different things. Well, that can be a very interesting part too then, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> you, were uh, you were working up to a climax from the beginning, and now you've reached it. We finished the broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, we stopped for a cup of tea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we stopped for a cup of tea, but, you know, I will put this in two, uh, in two parts so that people have to wait a few days until I upload the other part. <laughs> All right.